Notice again we have CH2 groups, but they are equivalent because there's no stereocenters. There's no stereocenters here, so the hydrogens in the CH2 groups are, uh, these two are equivalent, and these two are equivalent to each other. Now, which of these then should be furthest to the left, A, B, or C? Furthest to the left would be A. Wait, yes, A. And, and then, then B. And then C. And then C. I'm not trying to get the exact numerical positions right here. We're just showing qualitatively what the relationships would be. Okay, good. By the way, why are these two peaks shorter? Well, how many hydrogens does this peak represent? Well, they got two. Yeah, and this represents three. So I'm also, uh, roughly speaking, showing the number of hydrogens with the heights of the peaks, even though we're mainly focusing now on horizontal position. Okay, so this shows if you're next to, if you're close to something electronegative, you'll be deshielded, which is downfield. Mm -hmm. Maybe just as a memory aid, downfield starts with a D, and deshielded starts with a D. So those are both the same side, which is the left-hand side of our horizontal axis here. This is a very important piece of information for deciphering structure. If you see something to the left, that means it's, it's likely to be close to something electronegative. Okay, now this fluorine here is gonna pull these pretty far to the left. And it's gonna pull these moderately to the left. It's actually gonna have a very small impact on these hydrogens. Mm -hmm. And if there was even hydrogens even further away, it would still have an impact on them, but very, very small. So probably this fluorine is only gonna have a significant impact on the hydrogens on the carbon it's attached to and maybe the next carbon. Maybe one carbon away is too far to even notice the impact. Or if you could notice that impact, you probably still definitely would not notice the impact if there was another carbon even further away. So this effect definitely falls off pretty quickly with the distance from the electronegative atom. How many peaks here? Two. Now, which peak is going to be further to the left, the A peak or the B peak? Uh, I believe fluorine is the most electronegative, so right. A and B. By the way, these should have the same height because they both represent two hydrogens. All right. So now, these hydrogens are very close to a fluorine, and these hydrogens are very close to a chlorine. Well, as you figured out, the fluorine has a bigger impact because it's more electronegative. So I don't know if we specifically talked about that before, but you figured it out. If an electronegative atom deshields you, then the more electronegative it is, the bigger the deshielding effect is going to be, and the further to the left you're going to be shifted. So there's going to be a big left shift for A. There's going to be a big left shift for B too, but not as big as for A. These would both be big shifts. These would both be big shifts because not only is the A close to a fluorine, it's not very far from a chlorine. And not only is the B close to a chlorine, it's not very far from a fluorine. But still, the A's are closest to the more electronegative, so they would have the further left-hand shift. Good. How many absorptions here? The, okay, so there's A and B. It's two fluorines, which makes it extremely electronegative. That's right. By the way, is this peak going to be the taller peak or the shorter peak? The shorter peak. Good. So it'll look something like this. Good. Now, all of these are going to be pretty far downshifted, pretty far shifted to the left because there's lots of electronegative atoms here. Mm -hmm. However, this hydrogen here is next to two fluorines, and this is only next to one. So you figured out something else that we haven't talked about yet which is if an electronegative atom makes you deshielded, then the more electronegative atoms you're close to, the more deshielded you would be. It's kind of an additive effect. Now, one of the things that you're likely to have to do with spectroscopy is they're gonna give you a printout and you have to assign the peaks. That is, they're gonna say, if this is A and this is B, well, you have to assign the letters. Basically, you have to assign the letters and then say which letters go to which peaks. Well, now we're learning how to do that. Now we're learning how to do that. For example, if you got this printout, 
there would be two clues that this is A and this is B. There's two ways you could figure it out. First of all, you could say, well, I know this has to be A because A represents only one hydrogen, so it should be the shorter peak. And I also know this has to be A because on the left-hand peak is the one with the two fluorines. They should be further to the left. So now we're learning the practical skills that you need to actually figure out which peaks correspond to which hydrogens. Okay. Generally speaking, alkane hydrogens absorb in the 5 to 0 region. Generally speaking, alkane hydrogens are in the 5 to 0 region. And alkene hydrogens are in the 4.5 to 10 region. even if there's electronegative atoms. So if there's an electronegative atom, it would tend to be on the left-hand side of this region. Oh. And if there's no electronegative atom, it would tend to be on the right-hand side. So generally speaking, so that, that, that was a good question. We'll get to that in a second. If you have a hydrogen in an alkane and no electronegatives, it would be on the right-hand side here. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there was an electronegative atom, it would tend to be closer to five. Okay. On the other hand, for alkenes, if you have a normal alkene with no electronegatives, it would be around five. Whereas if you have electronegative atoms, it might be closer to 10. Okay. In fact, so we can split this region up into two subregions. What's half of 5? Well, that would be 2.5. So for example, these hydrogens would tend to absorb around here, mm -hmm. on the right-hand side of this region, pretty right. close to zero, probably between zero and one, mm -hmm. very low peak. Whereas these hydrogens would tend to be around here, on the left-hand side between 2.5 and 5. So these, these would be, tend to be around here. And it's cumulative. Maybe these would tend to be over here, even closer to five, because now there's two fluorines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in fact, if there's three fluorines, we might not even break out into the above five region. Right. So all of these things are just rules of thumb. So you could have an alkane hydrogen that's even to the left of five if there was tons of electronegative elements next to it. These are all just rules of thumb that are helpful. However, so one electronegative element would probably put you somewhere between 2.5 and maybe four, and two electronegative elements might put you closer to five over here, just as rules of thumb. And if, you don't, if you're not right next to electronegative, you might be over here. What about what about, say, these hydrogens? Well, these hydrogens are not attached to a carbon with an electronegative element, but they're attached to a carbon that's attached to a carbon with an electronegative element. So they're still going to be on the right-hand side here, so they're less, less than 2.5, okay. but they're going to be on the left-hand side of the right-hand region here. They're going to be closer to 2.5 than 0. So again, notice that what's the difference between these hydrogens and these hydrogens here? These hydrogens are on carbons that are directly connect, uh, connected to a fluorine. These hydrogens are on carbons con directly connected to a fluorine, so they're on the left-hand side between 2.5 and 5. Whereas this is on a hydrogen, these are not directly connected to the fluorine, but the adjacent carbon has the fluorine. Well, this is still less than 2.5, but it's closer to 2.5 than these over here. Mm -hmm. All right, and again, these are just kind of rules of thumb. That make any sense? Mm -hmm. All right. 
Now, these are just rules of thumb. You can actually look up much more precise predictions in tables. Do you get to use tables during the quiz? Uh, you should, they should probably give you like a table of the chemical shifts, I would think, during the quiz. Or you, you should ask the instructor whether you're going to have that. Basically, uh, if they're not going to give you that table, you might need to memorize some chemical shifts. But these are the basic rules of thumb for that. You have this in your notes. I'll erase this now.